Okay, I'm about to discuss a concept that might be foreign to most of you gamers, but bear with me. When I walk into the gym, I get very excited. I love going to the weight machine and pumping some iron with the boys or with my girlfriend. All right, I'm really rubbing it in now. Essentially, the gym excites me because it makes me feel like I'm bettering myself. It gives me a goal to work towards. In a way, the entire gym feels like a treadmill. Sure, in the moment it's not the most fun, but it's about being on that loop of constant improvement. This is why, when you miss one day of your normal workout routine, it's hard to convince yourself to go again the next day. You feel like you missed out. The only other place I find this feeling is in Valorant. Now, I know that analogy is going to lose some of you, but please stick with me. Valorant is a 5 vs 5 tactical shooter developed by Riot Games that launched in 2020. It was positioned as a competitor to Counter-Strike Global Offensive developed by Valve, which basically had a monopoly over the tactical shooter genre, both in player count and viewership. Valorant offers players a consistent, treadmill-esque grind for improvement. The ranked system has nine major ranks, Iron, Bronze, Silver, Gold, Platinum, Diamond, Ascendant, Immortal, and Radiant. Each of these ranks, except Radiant, has their own divisions scaling from one to three, with one being the lowest and three being the highest. This simple to understand system is why so many players flock to Valorant, and why some psychos like me have nearly 3,000 hours in the game. It's simple and fun, and it honestly feels like going to the gym. The only difference is if I spent 3,000 hours in the gym instead of playing Valorant, I would look like The Rock instead of suffering from depression. I don't play Valorant ranked to have fun. I play to compete and have a battle of the brains with the enemy team. This is funny because most of my ranked games look like five monkeys who just discovered what a keyboard and mouse are. Since its release, I have absolutely fallen in love with Valorant, and I never go more than a few days without at least watching some professional games or playing the game myself. Despite this though, CSGO has always terrified me. At the beginning of Valorant's lifespan, a lot of the top content creators and competitors were former Counter-Strike players. A lot of these players would always talk about how Counter-Strike is like chess and Valorant is like checkers. For this reason, I always avoided Counter-Strike. I didn't want to sink even more time into another game that I would be even worse at. I didn't need that in my life. But I was always curious about the other side of the pond. I'd always wondered what all the hype was about. Then, in early 2023, Valve did the unthinkable. More on that later. They announced Counter-Strike 2. Now, in order for you to understand just how big of a deal this is, you must first understand the history of Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike first came into existence as a mod for the PC shooter Half-Life. At first, it was entirely a community-run project. The original Counter-Strike is honestly pretty similar to the iteration of the game we have today. In fact, some of the maps are even the same. The mod pitted two teams of five people against each other. One team was terrorists, the other counter-terrorists. Now, the terrorist's objective is to plant a bomb at one of two bomb sites on a map before the round ends. The counter-terrorist's objective is to stop the terrorists from planting the bomb or defuse it before it detonates. The concept is very simple to understand, and honestly, a lot of the game's long-term popularity can be attributed to the simplicity of it. Valve, after seeing the relative popularity and potential of this mod, decided to bring the developers under the Valve umbrella and expand on Counter-Strike. In the year 2000, Counter-Strike hit store shelves. A few years later, the game also came to Xbox. This game is now commonly referred to in esports circles as 1.6. 1.6 is where a lot of things Counter-Strike is famous for really began. Many maps such as Dust2, Inferno, and Mirage were born here. And this is also when people started to take Counter-Strike competition seriously. Counter-Strike was loved by fans for having a very high skill ceiling. It always felt like there was a way to play a situation better and you just didn't think of it. A few years later, in 2004, the next major installment of Counter-Strike was released. Counter-Strike Source. Source was titled after the game engine that Valve had created for Half-Life 2. Valve developed this iteration of Counter-Strike on the Source engine as part of a company-wide shift to move all of their products onto Source Engine and Steam, their new digital games marketplace. Source doesn't get the same love that 1.6 does. Many players complain about the movement and gunplay feeling a bit wonky compared to 1.6. However, over the years, much of the most important Counter-Strike tournaments switched over to Source. After Source, there wasn't a new iteration of Counter-Strike released for eight years. Eight years. Two presidential terms. For eight years, people continued to play Source and 1.6 despite countless other shooters being released on the market. And the reason for this is simple. The game. 
The core game of Counter-Strike is so widely beloved and satisfying that Valve was able to go eight years without releasing a title and still have people clamoring for more. This brings us to 2012 and the release of Counter-Strike Global Offensive. CSGO is a game that many of you have heard of already, so I won't waste your time or mine by explaining it to you. What I'll do instead is show footage from a recent major to signify just how rabid people are about Counter-Strike. Be relatively straightforward. Electronic with the opening kill over the top of the smoke. OG falling back. That's precise, and he gets another over the top. God oh, damn. filthy. Absolutely filthy. Simple showed up. As you can see, people take this shit seriously. In fact, so seriously that there are actual government organizations involved in monitoring the competitive integrity of matches, and there's also legislation in the works in many countries specifically surrounding the game's skin marketplace. There's enough content there for a whole separate video. Suffice it to say, Counter-Strike isn't your typical FPS game. Now that you know the history of Counter-Strike Global Offensive, I think it's important to talk about the longevity of it. CSGO was the premier tactical shooter from 2012 until 2023. This specific installment of Counter-Strike held a tenure that very few games can manage, even games made by even bigger studios than Valve. It's a bar that any game can only dream of clearing, and to be honest, Valve made it look easy. In fact, they made it look so easy that they let themselves take their foot off the gas a little bit. For the first few years of its lifespan, CSGO had relatively frequent updates to adjust the game balance, change the maps, and offer players things they were looking for out of the game. But as the years went on, Valve seemed less inclined to adjust the game. It didn't just happen overnight, but gradually, like a dying marriage, over the course of many years. The few times they did make big changes, such as the rework and reinstatement of Vertigo, or the release of the weapon the R8, they were met by such an intense level of community vitriol that Valve seemed less inclined to make any changes. For years, the community was outraged over the lack of care and support that Valve was showing the game. It felt kind of like the odd stepchild that Valve just didn't want to deal with. Slowly, over time, this lack of care for the game from Valve's end seeped into the community sentiment surrounding the game. Players were sick of playing a game that had such a little support aside from the bare minimum of seasonal content and map rotations. Cheaters ran rampant in matchmaking, bugs and issues went unaddressed for years, and players were fed up. This led to a gradual exodus between the years of 2017 to 2020. This exodus hit North America the hardest because the competitive scene wasn't nearly as big in that region compared to the likes of Europe or Brazil. Seeing this gap in Valve's own game, someone was bound to capitalize. That someone? Riot Games. In October of 2019, Riot Games released the first official teaser for Project A. Project A is our character-based tactical shooter. It's competitive. It has precise gunplay. Precise gunplay. Precise gunplay. Project A was a tactical shooter developed by an internal team made up of former Counter-Strike 1.6 developers. The people behind Project A were veterans of the tactical shooter genre, so naturally people were excited. A few months later, in March of 2020, Project A resurfaced, but this time with a new name and a fresh coat of paint. Valorant entered its beta in March of 2020 and was an immediate success. It was lacking content, it only had three maps during the beta period, and some things were a bit overtuned. Mm, the operator! <laughs> but it was clear that the bones of the game were good. And with the support of a company like Riot, who is famously good at supporting their games with new content and features over the long term, it seemed like nothing could go wrong. Three months later, in June of 2020, Valorant officially released. Valorant was a massive success and it only grew over time. To this day, Valorant is still thriving, and as of March of 2023, it has amassed over 20 million players, according to Tracker.gg. With the release of Valorant, many in the Counter-Strike community were left wondering what Valve would do. This was the first time Valve had ever seen true competition in the tax shooter space, and it's an enemy that they were familiar with, having competed against Riot in the MOBA space for years. But Valve stayed silent. They sat on their hands and twiddled their thumbs until they were ready. That time came in 2023, when Valve announced Counter-Strike 2, the long-awaited sequel to CSGO. 
Counter-Strike 2 went into a very selective closed beta soon after its announcement. During the announcement video, Valve made a big deal about three key things. Map overhauls, changes to smokes and grenades, and the shift over to new servers for players and matchmaking. Now, that might sound like gibberish to some of you, so let me explain. Basically what that means is they committed to making the game look better, play smoother, and have a higher skill ceiling than ever before. These changes, and the name switching from CSGO to CS2, were clearly meant to entice new players into trying out the game. The game also shifted to a free-to-play model, further magnifying Valve's intentions with the game. These changes excited old players as well. After all, the CS community had been collectively sitting in the cuck chair for three years watching Valorant slowly rise in popularity while Mommy Riot showed Daddy Gaben what a strap-on felt like. That selective beta I mentioned earlier slowly opened up to more and more players until finally, Counter-Strike 2 officially released on September 27th, 2023. Now with that history lesson out of the way, we get into the point of the video. I had never played Counter-Strike until about a week ago. Not seriously, at least. I spent many hours surfing back in the day because I saw Leafy was here do it and I wanted to be cool like him. Oh, how that turned out. I also have played a few casual matches here and there just to give the game a go, but I never sat down and put serious hours into Counter-Strike. I do, however, have over 2,500 hours in Valorant and a YouTube channel in desperate need of more content. Please like and subscribe and support on Patreon, links in the description. So with the intention of making this video, I played over 20 matches of Premiere just to get an idea for what all the fuss was about. And this is what I found. Now, a quick disclaimer before I get into my findings. Um, I am not a Counter-Strike professional by any means. I have no prior experience with the game, and there are a lot of issues the community has with the game, because of course they do. And so I'm going to leave in the description a few links to some videos going over what the community's problems are with CS2 in case you're interested. Now, over the course of the last week, I've spent roughly 30 to 40 hours with Counter-Strike 2. While this is nowhere near enough time to come anywhere close to fully evaluating all of the nuances of the game, that's not what this video is about. This video is about what it's like to be a new player. To unlock Premiere, which is the premier mode of Counter-Strike 2's ranked system, you must play a certain number of casual matches and or death matches. I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but basically there's a progress bar that starts at zero, but for every casual game mode match you play, it goes up a little bit. Immediately upon loading into my first death match, I was instantly shocked by how different the movement felt from Valorant. The best way I can describe it is if Valorant is walking, CS2 feels like ice skating. It feels very floaty and there's a sense of acceleration and deceleration. I'm pretty sure this is the staple feeling of movement in the Source engine, but I'm not entirely positive. Guns are another thing that feel very different. In Valorant, guns have random spray patterns, which means the more you spray, the more random your bullets are going to be. Counter-Strike, however, has consistent spray patterns, which means they can be memorized, and in theory, every bullet fired can go exactly where you want it to go. If you're good enough, that is. Speaking of, the thing I underestimated the most going into this was my own inexperience. Counter-Strike has been around in some way, shape, or form for over 20 years. This means that some of the people in my lobbies have been playing this game for up to 20 years. 20 years of experience is a lot. This led to almost every engagement in my first few death matches to be an instant death. I was getting murdered every five seconds. It was not fun. But eventually, I was able to hold my own. My Valorant muscle memory kicked in after a few death matches, and I started being able to one-tap people. Once you get into it, it's honestly crazy how similar the two games feel. Part of that is because I use the same crosshair and sensitivity in both games, but still, the act of shooting the gun and adjusting for recoil is honestly very similar. The major difference in the gunfights is honestly just the feeling. This is what a kill looks like in Valorant. Have it on him. Just tickle him. And this is what a kill looks like in Counter-Strike 2. I said on him. In Valorant, the kills have effects and sounds and bullet tracers that make the endorphins in your brain look like the Chicago fire. In Counter-Strike 2, kills feel very unenthusiastic. If you shoot someone, they just fucking die. Drop dead, only a little splatter of blood before they ragdoll onto the floor. Now, this makes sense, since Counter-Strike has always been about realism, but it's still a little disconcerting in comparison to other games. After grasping the basics of the game and going through many death matches, I finally unlocked the ability to play Premiere, and thus, my journey into Counter-Strike truly began. When you first load into a game of Premiere, you don't load into a game. 
you start with a pick band stage. For those unaware, a pick band stage comes from the competitive circuit and involves two teams going back and forth banning maps until only one remains. You then decide which team starts as terrorists and which starts as counter-terrorists, T-side and CT-side for short. I think this is a cool system, and I really wish Valorant would instate something similar. Sometimes there are maps that I really don't want to play, and not having a say in that matter is very frustrating. Now, it is a little bit different with Counter-Strike, since these maps have been around for 20 years, and it's expected that everyone knows them. For instance, even if you've never played Counter-Strike in your life, if you're watching this video, I guarantee you've seen this map. But with Valorant, all the maps have come out in the last three years, so for people to get comfortable with the maps, you must force them to play them even if they don't like them at first. But, as someone with over 2,500 hours in Valorant who could navigate every map with my eyes closed, queuing into Breeze for the sixth time in a row is a bit annoying, and I wish there was a way to counter it. After playing my first few Premiere games, I was hooked. There's three major reasons for this that I'd like to touch on. Shooting, outplay potential, and the community. Let's start with the shooting. The guns in this game feel great. They feel better than they do in Valorant, in fact, and almost every weapon in the economy has a vastly different feeling to it. I'm going to highlight three weapons to show the depth of the gunplay in CS2. The AWP, the AK, and the Desert Eagle. These three weapons are the most important in Counter-Strike's gunplay. Now, a quick overview of how weapons work in Counter-Strike. All weapons used in a round must be bought. In fact, everything in Counter-Strike must be bought. Fucking capitalism, man! Money in Counter-Strike is earned by getting kills, planting the bomb, and finishing a round. More money for winning, less for losing. Weapons are priced based on their usability and versatility. The Desert Eagle costs $700, the AK-47 costs $2,700, and the AWP costs $4,750. Now, I'm sure most of you know this, but just in case, the Desert Eagle is a pistol that is a one-shot kill to the head, the AK-47 is an assault rifle that is also a one-shot kill to the head, and the AWP is a sniper rifle that's a one-shot kill to anywhere on the body except the legs and feet. The reason I believe these are the most important weapons in the game is because they are the deadliest. All three of these weapons can just put someone down in an instant, and so they force respect from both you and your opponents. This, in my opinion, is the crux of the tactical shooter genre. If these guns didn't exist in the manner in which they do, players wouldn't be forced into respecting enemy skill. But if someone is holding an angle with one of these weapons, they have an inherent advantage. At least they should. So, assuming skill levels are the same slash similar, swinging into one of these weapons, more often than not, means instant death. This forces you to use utilities such as a flash, a smoke, or a molly to give yourself the advantage, or at least even the odds. This brings me to my next point. Outplays. Outplays are the best part of any tactical shooter. Let me set the scene. Look at this map. Let's say there's a guy holding long A with an op. If you were to swing into him with a Desert Eagle, 9 times out of 10, you're losing that fight. So, what do you do? Do you just let him have control over that side of the map? Well, that doesn't work, because if you just give up this space, then the enemy team knows you can't come A through long, so they can just stack players catwalk, middle, and B. So what do you do then? This is where the concept of utility is really important. You can use any piece of utility you want to counter this op. Personally, I would toss a left-click flashbang high over this building and then swing the op, but the choice is up to you. What I've outlined here is the most basic of outplays that came because of well-timed utility. There are countless scenarios like this I've come across, and that's just in one week of playtime. Now, as a Valorant player, I expected to be making outplays in CS2. However, I didn't realize just how flexible and nuanced the game's problem-solving systems really are. Any piece of utility can be used to counter an enemy, opper or rifler. You just must have map knowledge and creativity to set yourself up for success. This can be something as simple as knowing common angles to flash or molly before you peek a corner, or this can involve having preset strategies that revolve around smoke or god flash lineups. The point is, you are rewarded for knowing more about the game in Counter-Strike. This contrasts with outplays in Valorant. In Valorant, each agent has unique utility, and some agents just don't have the correct kit or abilities for a certain situation, making an outplay much harder to achieve. This is vastly different to Counter-Strike, where all five players on each team have access to the same pieces of utility. This leads to a much more balanced game state, in my opinion. The last thing that surprised me about my week with CS2 that I'd like to touch on is the community. The Counter-Strike community is often looked at in a negative light, sometimes with good reason. A lot of the people that play Counter-Strike, even some of the ones I've encountered over the past week, are entitled, whiny, and rude. But 
I would say, as with most online communities, a few bad apples shouldn't spoil the bunch. Sure, some people are assholes on the internet. In other news, water is wet. But that's going to happen in any online community. Over my 30 to 40 hours in CS2, most of the people I encountered were friendly, funny, and most of all helpful in teaching me the ropes of the game. One guy showed me a flash lineup that I use every time I peek mid on Mirage. Another guy taught me all the callouts on the map Vertigo. In fact, I'd say most of the people I communicated with while playing are among the nicest people I've ever interacted with in a competitive online game. I will say this though. The Counter-Strike community is ancient compared to any other popular multiplayer game I've played. Most of the people I talked to while playing were full-grown adults with children, 9-to-5 jobs, mortgages, and car payments. This is in stark contrast to Valorant, where I'd say much of the community is between 16 and 22 years of age. I think this leads the Counter-Strike community to feel much more mature in comparison. In Valorant, I'll have some 15-year-old kid barking in my ear for two minutes straight because he wants my op skin. In Counter-Strike, if someone wants my skin, they'll just say, Hey Green, can I get your skin? I don't think either is necessarily better or worse than the other, I think it just depends on your personal preference. It's kind of like the difference between people you'll meet at the gym. Usually the younger people are over by the weight machines, whereas older people tend to flock to the free weights and chest press area. This now brings us full circle. Over the course of my week with Counter-Strike 2, I learned a lot. I got better learned the maps, and learned the proper way to execute the fundamentals of the game, such as trading, utility usage, and communication. I still have a very long way to go before I reach Global Elite, but I'm excited to start my journey. I started this video by comparing ranked systems, specifically in tank shooters, as that's my area of expertise, to the process of going to the gym, and I think that holds true. After journeying through Counter-Strike, teaching myself about its storied history, and learning how to play the game, I feel like I've just completed my first week at the gym that is Counter-Strike 2. Sure, there aren't any major noticeable improvements yet, but I've just begun my journey, and I'm excited to see how far I can go and where my peak will lie. It won't replace Valorant in my heart. I don't think any game ever will. But it's another game where I can start a new road to improvement, and I'm excited to dive back in. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to read a full print version of this review, you can find that on my Patreon, along with tons of other goodies such as live streams, messages, and producer perks. Thank you so much for being here and supporting me. It means the world.